Good morning. My name is Miley Kuyper, and it is an honor to introduce Professor Dina McCarthy to you today as our Sustainability Week keynote speaker. One of the nation's most respected voices on the environment and public health, former EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy is now a Harvard professor leading strategies and actions at the Harvard T.H. Chang School of Public Health, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and in the corporate and nonprofit sectors. At Harvard T.H. Chang, she is the professor of the practice of public health in the Department of Environmental Health, and she and the director of for the, the director of the Center for Health and the government, uh, the global environment. In this capacity, Professor McCarthy leads the development of the school's strategy to turn climate and health science into actions that promote a more sustainable and just world. During her 35 years of public service in both Republican and Democratic administrations, Professor McCarthy dedicated herself to environmental protection and public health. Her leadership and perseverance uh, led to federal, state, and local actions on critical environmental issues. From 2013 to 2017, Professor McCarthy served as Administrator for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, under President Obama. Prior to her role as EPA Administrator, Professor McCarthy held a position of Assistant Administrator in the EPA's Office of Air and Radiation and served as the Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Environmental Protection. Professor McCarthy earned a Bachelor of Arts in Social Anthropology from the University of Massachusetts at Boston and a Joint Master of Science in Environmental Health, Engineering, Planning, and Policy from Tufts University. Following this meeting, uh, Professor McCarthy will be available for a Q&A in the faculty room until the end of uh, F-Block, so please help me welcome <coughs> Professor Gina McCarthy. Thank you, Miley. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sustainability Week. Wow, I'm done. First of all, I'm really excited to be back in Connecticut. Um, I have been uh, sort of considering Connecticut my home away from home. I spent five years here, and it was a great state, and I had a lot of fun before I got the call from President Obama to go to the US EPA, which ended up being more fun uh, and annoying all at the same time. So that's, that's life. But it, it's really great to be here, and I always, I'm always excited to be like absolutely anywhere other than Washington, D.C., uh, because Washington, D.C. is a, a little bit out of control these days, if you ask my opinion of this, which you didn't, but I'm here to offer it anyways. So I don't really care what you want to hear. I know what I want to say, and I'm going to do it. So there we have it. You know, it, it, my, my goal today is really to talk about what's going on in Washington, but more importantly, to talk about what's going on everywhere other than Washington. Because I want to make sure in a school like this that has students from across the world that you understand that the United States of America is the United States of America. We care about one another, we care about our health, we care about our safety, and we are going to do our part on climate change, period, end of discussion, okay? That's what I want you all to understand. Because if truth be told, no matter what you hear about Washington, D.C., there's a lot of really good things happening in the United States. And it's about time we talked about those and stopped being inundated by negativity. I am going to leave you hopeful today, and then you're going to go out and do everything for Sustainability Week that you can to show that you're going to step up. Listen, I am 65 years old. I am not done yet. You can't be done yet. So, I am not coming here to say I'm really sorry my generation screwed up the world. Good luck to you. I am here to tell you that good things are happening. We're staying in the fight, and we're going to work together to make sure that we can create a sustainable future for you. All right? That's what it's all about. 
So I want to tell you, I am absolutely not thrilled with what's going on in, in Washington, D.C. in this administration at my beloved U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and beyond. Now, to say I'm not thrilled is a very polite way to say this. So because I'm at a school, I won't say what I really think. But I'm not pleased. You know, I th I'm sure you've read all about the rollbacks and and which is basically anything that President Obama thought was a good idea is being undone, uh, including all of many of the, the fundamental protections of our environment and public health are being rolled back. And, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of the good people who work at the federal level are feeling quite uh, disengaged and devalued which is too bad, but they're hanging in there because that's what they do, which is great. But I want to tell you that every morning when I wake up, right, I wake up to my husband screaming at MSNBC because he's just addicted to it. He loves looking at all the political stuff going on. And then he goes, oh, look at this tweet that the president just, uh, and he screams and yells and screams and yells, and I end up getting up, right? And I'm like, okay, this is all about stuff that I did for eight years that's all being supposedly undone. And so I tell him, Ken, I really love you very much, but shut up. <laughs> Turn the television off. <laughs> Have a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> Smells good, tastes good. If you want Starbucks, go for it but let's relax here and realize that this is a temporary annoyance and we have to get on with our lives. We have to think about all of the great things that are happening outside and we have to remember one thing and I want you to keep this in mind. As you're reading about all the rollbacks of water protections and air protections, all the climate stuff we did to clean up power plants and other things, Look, there's, there's two things that really provide me a lot of comfort. One is that, these th that when we did these rules, we followed two things, science and the law. And we had the most transparent democratic process that we could have to make sure that we understood what people want and need and how we protect people from and our natural resources from pollution. That's what we did. This administration doesn't pay attention to the law, doesn't pay attention to science. I will meet them in court any day, and we are going to win. And it shows in terms of just how much they are succeeding in court. They have an 8% success rate when they're challenged with their laws. So I figure a 92% approval rating ain't bad, folks. We are winning. And secondly, I know that there is a lot of effort underway to start thinking about what else we can do later to make up for lost time. And how do we support efforts at every other level of government, which is equally important in many ways in the environment to what's going on in terms of, of what's happening at EPA. So look, uh, the first thing I want to tell you is that Let's, let's talk a little bit about climate change, which to me is the most significant public health challenge we face. I talk about public health a lot. It's also the most significant economic challenge, and it's also the most significant international and national security challenge we all face. But, but what it's really important to keep in mind is that climate change isn't about polar bears or glaciers. Every time you see a news report, they'll talk about climate change and that's what you'll see behind them. That is not what it's about. Yes, that may be some of the change that we're seeing as a result of the change in our planet's climate, but it's about you. It's about you individuals. It's not about a faraway place. It's not about 2050. It's about what's happening to you in your life today. We have to recognize that climate change isn't a problem for the planet. The planet doesn't give a damn if human beings live in it. 
We care if human beings live in it. So let's start talking about climate change differently. Let's recognize that it is about us, not about faraway places. And let's dumb it down a little bit to stop talking about all these big, massive changes. And let's recognize that climate change is a result of pollution. It is carbon pollution that is fueling climate change. And when I say carbon, it's C-A-H-B-O-N. I saw you giggle when, when I said carbon. Get over it. That's how I talk. I ain't changing that for anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Boston. Go Boston. Boston strong. Thank you. Thank you. But look it, if, if you think about it just as pollution, you'll realize if you look at the long history, like mine and others, you will see that we've been attacking pollution for a long time, and in many cases with great success. But we have a real challenge here, folks. Carbon pollution is coming like other air pollution, and it is damaging us today. Nine million people every year die prematurely in the world as a result of exposure to pollution. Most of those are kids and the elderly. Most of them are women, kids, and elderly. Most of them are low-income, minority, women, kids, and elderly. Because pollution is not an equal opportunity killer. It goes after those who are most vulnerable. And seven million of those die as a result of, of air pollution. And air pollution always goes hand in hand with fossil fuels, always goes hand in hand with carbon pollution and methane pollution that's driven as a result of our reliance on fossil fuels. So if we dumb this down a little bit, we have both understanding of the problem, we know it's about us, and we have solutions that we can talk about that aren't sacrifices. They're actually a path to a more sustainable and just future. Why don't we stop arguing about the science and climate change and start looking at a better future for ourselves and for our kids? That's what we can do if you focus on climate change. So if you don't stop being negative, I'm going to find you. And if you don't stop being hopeful, I'm going to run after you until you figure out that what you need to do to tackle climate change is exactly what you need to do to have a better future. It's exactly what you need to do to be healthier, and it is exactly what we need to bring equity to the table. We need a more just world, and you cannot have it if the vast majority of low-income and minority people are actually facing tremendous public health challenges as a result not just of climate change but of traditional pollutants. So if we stay hopeful and if we get our heads out of DC, we will soon see that there's remarkable things happening even in the United States of crazy America right now, okay? There's good things happening. And I want you to understand one thing as well, that, the, that I have worked at every level of government. I've worked at the local level, I've worked at the state level in Massachusetts and Connecticut, and I've worked for President Obama for seven and a half years in, in uh, DC. And I figured out that while climate change is always seen as the most partisan issue in history, it perhaps is, and the environmental agency is always seen as, as a, a partisan place where we're all crazy liberal leftists. Oh, sure, I am, but not everybody is. <laughs> no, it's just really, for some reason, a very political place. But I worked at, during my career for six governors. Five of them were Republicans. Five of them. I was appointed first by Governor Dukakis. Do you remember him? He ran for president, if you're following your history books at all. He lost. And I, I left the administration uh, uh, halfway through the Romney administration in Massachusetts. He was a Republican who also lost the presidency. Now, none of this is my fault. Just because I, I know them, it was not my fault. Uh, but the issue I, I really want you to understand, and then I came here and I worked for Jody Rell. You know, uh, the, the environment isn't a partisan issue. 
Our health is not a partisan issue. Climate change is not a partisan issue. Science is not a partisan issue. We cannot let the partisanship that's dividing this country stop us from making progress moving forward on fundamental things that you and I need to be healthy. So we have to look at where there are opportunities arise. And I know having worked at every level of government that the federal government actually never has an innovative thought in its entire life. I looked for eight years for one, and I couldn't find one. And the reason being is if you check your history books at how democracy is supposed to work, it's supposed to work from the bottom up. It is supposed to be a, a you know, basically a government that's of, by, and for the people, which means the federal government is always the last to act, not the first. It means that everything good in the environment and beyond starts at the community level and it works its way up. This is how it works. A community gets upset about a condition, they start screaming and yelling about it, they start doing things on their own, states start to get nervous that communities are acting on their own and doing things, and so states start looking at those issues and they decide 10, 15 years after the community was talking that maybe they should do some of what the community said, and then states get together and they work as regions and then states are all over the place with different solutions to the same problem, and then the federal government stands up and they say, I have the most wonderful idea. 30 years later, they claim success in thinking about something creative that was actually what that very first community identified 30 years before. That's how it works. So if the federal government isn't in the game, don't worry about it. Let's start working at the community level. Let's start working in this school. Let's start working in our churches. Let's start working in our own home communities to work together, because that is what's happening today. Remember, folks, we've made great progress. I wish you were around in the 70s and 80s. I know you don't, but I wish you were. Uh, not that old, but I wish you had been around, because you would see the difference between the world that I grew up in and the world that you're growing up in. You would have seen the kind of ridiculous pollution that we had uh, that was impacting our health every single day in the United States of America. And you would see how much has changed. In my beautiful Boston, you couldn't go in Boston Harbor without taking a tetanus shot uh, immediately following that. I mean, it was absolutely hideous hideous and the air pollution was like a, you had smog days for schools all over the place. It was crazy. So we can make progress. We don't have to be discouraged. So let me tell you what's going on these days. You know, we have uh, 25 states now that because of the lack of leadership on the federal level, states are stepping up because they have lots of authority to do things. Not all the authority rests with the federal government. Today we have 25 states that represent 55% of the population in the United States, and they have formed something called the U.S. Climate Alliance. And that alliance is getting together what essentially would, if you looked at them as a whole, the third largest economy in the world, and they have decided that they are going to comply with the Paris Agreement. They are going to meet those standards regardless of what the federal government does or doesn't do, and they are taking action to make sure that that happens. So if you're out looking for internships, don't search beyond your own community and your own state because they're going to want people, especially young people, there and active. That's where all the things are happening. We have states now like New Mexico, Nevada, Colorado, New Jersey, Virginia, not all states that have been bastions of support for EPA on natural resource protections, they are all in. They have leadership that won because they uh, agreed that they would take action on climate change. 
This is not just the Northeast in California talking anymore. And speaking of the Northeast, we have the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which I helped to move forward, which is the first cap and trade program that we have in the state for uh, carbon emissions from the power sector. And that, that, that program dropped emissions 47% between its start in 2008 and 2018. And, and it also made sure that electricity prices lowered by almost 6% while the GDP rose 47%. So if someone tells you you have to sacrifice the economy in order to have a healthy environment, you simply do not. You just have to be clever. You have to be thoughtful. You have to basically look at more than one uh, opportunity you have to both grow the economy while you reduce emissions. And now we have something called the Transportation and Climate Initiative uh, for uh, 10 states in, in New England and the Mid-Atlantic who are looking at establishing a tax and invest program to basically develop money to actually support changes in our transportation infrastructure, which looks at more green spaces, more bikeways, getting rid of cars, electrifying the system. We do not need to worry about how to repair the internal combustion engine if we can all agree to go with engines that don't need repairs. They're called electric. Better cars, better performance, no repair. What the hell is our problem? Just make them cheaper and get them out there. Right? That's what we have to do. You now have electric buses that are being put in our inner cities because guess what? The inner cities actually have tremendous air pollution that is killing our kids at a young age, giving them asthma, challenging them to be able to get to school and challenging adults to be able to get to work if their kids are sick. We can do better than this. We have to do better than this. And if you look at what's going on in California, well, California's California. They're always annoying. They just do things faster and better than anybody else. What's the matter with us, Northeast? Pick it up the pace. We have to get moving. Look, I've got 300 cities called America's Pledge who are working at the local level, the local level, to actually take over because leadership is waning elsewhere. They are going to make things happen. You have businesses now. That was the biggest announcement in New York, was three trillion uh, businesses representing three trillion dollars in investment are out, were out there saying they are going to start working together to actually make investments in innovation that the world needs to provide you more solutions and more opportunities moving forward for a sustainable future. You know, I worked for a, a company uh, called Pegasus Capital Advisors. They are out of New York City. They're a private equity firm. I work for them advising them on what does, what does a sustainable investment look like. We have money being poured into this system because it's not necessarily about whether you're a socialist government or a capitalist government. It's all about what you care about and how you generate market-based solutions to move forward. And we are making that happen in this country. We are not going to stand by and let businesses, as usual, continue. We have to bring that money to the table and start investing. I've worked with Bill Gates. He has a whole venture capital fund working, doing amazing things, looking at solutions moving forward. Big leaps in our economy and big leaps in our ability to do what we need to do on climate change. You know, you live in difficult but exciting times, and there are, there, it provides tremendous opportunities for you to step up and think about what you want to do with your life and how you can become part of this. It's opening up huge opportunities for new technology innovation, huge opportunities to connect the dots for sustainability, to make sure that those most vulnerable are not left behind. So we end up with a more just and equitable world. You know, when uh, I talk to the students at Harvard, where I am now, I, I spend a lot of time 
uh, talking about health because I decided instead of going to the Kennedy School where all of the old politicians go to die, no, I'm just kidding, they go to hang out. Uh, but I, I decided to go to the School of Public Health because to me fundamentally uh, climate change is, is really all about public health. And the challenge we have to get away from is the complexity of the issue needs to go away and it needs to be much more fundamental. You know, climate change impacts all of us today. It's not just the big events like the fires and the tornadoes and the hurricanes and the floods and the droughts. You know, it's as simple as, as, as vectors that carry diseases shifting. Why do you think you have all those signs up for Triple E now? Worried about all of the, the movement of that disease in ways that it didn't happen before, a West Nile virus. It's, it's about the fact that we have dengue fever in the United States of America. That will make people sit up and take notice, right? And we have basically heat stress that's going to be challenging all countries in the world to be able to figure out how to keep their elderly safe, how to get communities to work together once again to protect one another. We have tremendous nutrition challenges because climate change doesn't just suck up the nutrition out of our grains, our wheats. It, it actually uh, uh, provides tremendous stress in terms of flooding of our farmlands, which you see in the Midwest. You have droughts that are happening that are gonna challenge our very ability to figure out in 2050 how we feed the, the billions of human beings that are going to be alive. We need to switch from factory farms and red meat to a plant-based diet that is nutritious and to regenerative agriculture that makes our soil rich again instead of dumping pesticides and fertilizers on it. We cannot afford to grow like that. These are all fundamental health challenges that we have. And then we have the ocean filled with plastics. Plastics is fundamentally a problem, just like the carbon pollution from our air that's contaminating our air, because it's all about fossil fuels. We made the choice to rely on fossil fuels for almost virtually everything from drugs to chemicals to, to consumer products. We did that because it made sense a century and a half ago. It just doesn't anymore. So we have to step up. We have to look at what we have available to us for solutions. And if someone comes up to you and doesn't want to talk about solutions and instead wants to question the science, we are going to practice together how you respond to that. Are you ready? I want you to, after me, say three things. Number one, this is what you say to a climate denier. Number one, climate change is real. Man-made emissions have caused it. That's why women need to rule the world. I want to hear it. That's why women need to rule the world. Just say that and walk away. That's what you're going to do. Because I am tired of this. Man, you know, Washington is talking about rollbacks, but I'm going to tell you something. Clean energy is winning. It's not getting rolled back. As President Obama said many, many times in my presence that climate change is the biggest public health challenge of our time, but we can beat it as long as we stay hopeful, as long as we recognize that we have the ability in the United States of America to innovate. And we are unable and we should be unwilling to give up on a challenge that's as big as this. So if you want to kiss your you-know-what goodbye, go ahead. I am not going to do it, and neither would President Obama, because he stood up and he recognized that the country that grabs clean energy first is going to be the strongest country in the world. So stay hopeful. We didn't have millions of students out there reminding us of our responsibility because nobody cares about it. So we need marches that don't just have youth there, but have every generation who needs to work together and to fix this 
challenge and to face it head on. Because if you look at everything you need to do to correct climate change, you will see that doing that will produce a healthier, stronger, more economically viable, new jobs, new health opportunities, new food systems that can feed everyone, realistic expectations about how to protect water and how to minimize water use, increases in energy efficiency, new vehicles, new ways of getting around. This is what we need as a country, even if climate change wasn't happening. So let's get inspired. Let's just take this moment not to focus on Washington, but to focus on the brilliance of the United States and the fact that we do not back down. We do not let all of the countries that our pollution has damaged to, while we sit on the sidelines to do all the heavy work. We are going to be there, we have to be there, and with your help and your energy, we can continue to remind the old dudes like myself that the fight ain't over, it's just getting started. Thank you very much.